Hello and welcome back to the Not The Old Firm YouTube channel. My name is Ben Banks. Today we've got an exclusive interview for you again, this time with Carlisle United striker Gavin Riley, most known to us here in the SPFL for his time at Queen of the South, Dunfermline, St Mirren and Hearts. If you haven't already checked out some of the other exclusive content that's on the YouTube channel and our website, we advise you to do. We've got written pieces only with John Sutton and James Scott, both former Mullow strikers and John also having spells with various clubs in the SPFL. With wide ranging interviews with the two of them, we advise you to go and check out. On our YouTube channel, it's been Louis Fiorini and Mark Milligan in the past week. Louis Fiorini is a current Knack Breda player, having been on loan there from Manchester City and also being involved with the Scotland under 21s this week. Mark Milligan, looking forward to his new challenge at MacArthur FC, having been previously at Hibs, Southend, and captain in the Australia national team. We advise you to go and check out those bits of content. The videos will be on the YouTube channel and the written stuff will be in the description below, along with our reaction to the Scotland national team performances over the last week here on our YouTube channel. Today it's our chat with Gavin. We talk about his move to Carlisle United after a spell at Bristol Rovers, how our move nearly came about in January, some of his hopes for the season as well as reminiscent on his time in the SPFL. We hope you do enjoy. Please do remember to subscribe to us by hitting that subscribe button and clicking the notifications bell so you never miss a video from us. We had a nice wee show from HITC Sport, which is one of our sister sites here on the GRB Media Network. So a big thanks for that. And thanks to those who have came over from that channel to subscribe to our Scottish football content. We hope you do enjoy. Well, I'll leave you to my chat with Gavin Riley now. Please do subscribe, as I've already said. Take it easy. So I'll just get started then. How did this move to Carlisle come about? Well, I don't know if you've read, it was sort of in the pipeline in January. I came back from loan from Cheltenham and I spoke to them a couple of times over that sort of Christmas time period, got an offer sent through for them but never really had any time to sort of negotiate or discuss things because I got back and I basically played for Bristol Rovers when I got back so the ruling is in the EFL that you can't play for more than two teams in the one season so because I came back and played for Bristol Rovers I couldn't then go to them so it sort of fell through, things kept, kept, uh, kept in contact with them and then with the lockdown and stuff and then I got told I wasn't getting a new contract at Bristol Rovers. They, they came back in and I was just happy to get things tied up, basically. Okay, I know you're going to technically be playing in England, but it's more of a return to home for you. It's nice to be home. I mean, I was down there for two years, me and my missus with a wee one, and it's, it's a lovely part of the world, but it was hard work being down there on our own. So it's great to be back up, basically back up home. My missus is from Dumfries, I'm from Gretna, so... It, all the other side of things in terms of football was brilliant but at the same time I wanted to still play in England so in terms of the move it sort of ticked all boxes in terms of football and life outside of football mm -hmm. I think people really struggle to comprehend that almost for some players I know some players go down south and it's absolutely fine and it works great for them but for others like moving from like I think it was um, from where you were in Scotland to then moving basically to the other side of England is like it's quite a jump I'm I'm 27 now and I wasn't 22 and 27. it wasn't before I went to Hearts that I actually moved away from home because mm. when I was at Queen of the South I lived in Gretna at my dad's until I moved up there and then even though I was at St Mirren and Dunfermline I still stayed in Edinburgh but then like you said to go not just down England but to basically to the bottom of England basically <laughs> it was uh, it was a wee bit hard to begin with especially being in the hotel but a wee bit older than I was sort of you just got to get on with it basically but it is people don't consider that basically just think all right he's moved clubs he needs to go there and do well it's all them other little things that go with it so it's good to be settled basically that's weird because i don't know same you said you're 27 there i mean i'm only 19 but i think everybody in scottish football has got this picture of you as sort of the, the bright young kid breaking through like queen of the south i've come on a wee bit now yeah 27 oh, how do you feel about that uh, when I first came, the first week at Carlisle, it was a wee bit hard to take because there was only me and another player. That, I was 27, the other lad was 31, and the rest of them were all a lot younger than us. So it was a wee bit like, geez, a lot of wee bit. I'm definitely on the older scale now, but a couple of signs have come in and sort of evened out. I think we've got a, a good blend of youth and experience. Now, I'd like to say that I am I am an experienced head now. You could say the, the games I've played and the age I'm at. So hopefully I can pass that on. But it's still now, I still think the way I play, I still think I'm still 19 year old, basically. <laughs> nah, it's weird, cause, I mean, you're far off your bus passage yet and whatnot, but it must be a bit of a good experience for you now to, like, 
be that experienced head in the dressing room, especially at a team like Carlisle, where I'm assuming this year the squads are probably a wee bit weird. It's uh, they definitely cut them this year, so they will look, be looking to sort of the older guys to sort of lead. I wouldn't say I'm I'm not a captain, but the older guys have got to be to be there for the younger guys. I mean, if anyone comes and asks any questions, you've just got to just be honest and use your past experience from it, basically. I like to think that I have built up a good bit of experience now across in England and in Scotland, basically, as well. How has the EFL sort of transfer market been? Because I don't know how much it would have affected you at Carlisle, but there's obviously been the salary caps brought in this year and for a lot of players and clubs. In Definitely the- honest with you, I don't think it's affected anyone at Carlisle, to be honest. <laughs> I was about to say, Some, <laughs> something's, telling, <laughs> something's telling me, unless you've got a big, massive merc outside, then I doubt that Carlisle's probably one of the clubs that have been affected, but I'm assuming... Uh, I think it's more Another teams club, at the yeah. top end of the table, I think, in terms of like the the League One teams and the definitely the Championship teams as well. I think a couple of them will sort of feel the the, the strain of that now, but it, it is what it is. And I think I've not really looked into that to be fair. I think a lot of clubs have been asking for it for a few years now. Now that it's happened, I think you'll sort of see the effect of that. I think the only looking in, looking into it, I think it'll just hopefully make the league a wee bit more even rather than sort of there's a sort of big hitters at the top and the lower budgets at the bottom. I think. I think it was my agent that said to me, it's over the course of so many years, 10 seasons, the, 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 on average, a team with the biggest budget and the best budgets do well. It's just a fact, basically, that them teams do better. But you obviously get the, the odd one that proves, it, proves the, the book is wrong, almost, as you could say. So I wouldn't say, as Carla, we're one of the top budgets, but it would, I'd like to bring the togetherness that we've got, the team spirit, you can prove a lot of people wrong. Because I think that's one of the things, especially here, because it's obviously it's good for the teams in Scotland because it opens up the loan market a wee bit more as well in terms of getting players from Championship and League One, like players that perhaps wouldn't have been attainable last year are now suddenly a team like Carlisle could get them on the wage structure that you have in place. I think it was I think it was Mickey Mellon, the new Dundee United manager, done an article on that, and I think it definitely does that. Like I think from Championship to SPL the wage gap is, is humongous. There's teams down there that pay massive money. So like you said, now that them sort of caps are in, it has opened up, especially a loan market, to attract players to come up. And the thing is as well as from playing up in Scotland to now come down, if anyone asks me, it is a good standard of football folk, I think, down in England. I think it's just pure naivety more than anything because they're not been playing in it and not seen the games live. They don't realise actually how good a standard it actually is up there. So like you said, this season perhaps definitely with the the caps coming in, it could open up a lot of sort of loan markets for players coming up to Scotland. Mm. It's been you've been down south now for a few years. Do you find it a bit strange that you've been out of Scottish football for a considerable amount of time now? It feels. I think this is. It's been two years. This is my third year. It feels a lot longer than what it probably actually is. So three years. It feels like maybe five or six. But uh, it is different to Scotland. You play a hell of a lot more games. You do a hell of a lot more travelling. So. Like in Scotland, you play every team four times rather than England. It's just home and away. But it, uh, I always wanted to try and play down here. I mean, I played in Scotland and I ever got the opportunity, I wanted to try it. And I could say that I've done this. So like to, I'm not ruling out ever coming back or up to Scotland. But it, uh, it is definitely different. Mm, because I think speaking to, I know there's more than a few players these days that have been between the two leagues. And the big difference, like you say, is you're going from basically playing twice a week you can't really prepare for a game properly like you would up here in Scotland. Uh, to then players coming into Scotland and you basically have a full week to prepare. Your most tra- unless you're going to Dingwall or Dumfries, yeah. if you're some other teams, then you're not really having to travel much either. Yeah, Dumfries was all right for me because it was only around the corner. To be fair, <laughs> but yeah, I get what you mean. There's times where you're away first thing on a Monday and you're not getting you wait on a Friday morning and you're not back till Sunday morning, and then if you're away again on the Tuesday, you're away first thing on a Monday, and not back till Wednesday. So. Like you said, the preparation time is a lot different, but you've just got to try and do as much as you can, basically. That's where a lot of the, like, the analysis guys come into it, basically. So that's what they appear to do, basically. Is if you can't do enough, train, get enough work done on the training ground, that's where they come into full force. And you have your video meetings and your pre-match sort of meetings before the game. So it's, you've just got to try and do as much as you want, as much as you can, but it is, it is relentless. And I think this season, more than any, it'll be even more so. Mm-hmm, because you're obviously starting a wee bit later and you're still having to play 46 games on top of the 
the Johnson's Paint Trophy. Is it called the Johnson's Paint Trophy now? I think it's called. I think it's. I went went back to the EFL Trophy now. It's changed. It's like the one in Scotland. It's changed about five times. Over the, it was the Checker Trade. It was a Leeson dot com trophy or something like that. I mean, yeah. I think in Scotland it's changed about five times or something as well in the last five uh-huh. years. So, no, it, uh, we, we actually played that was our first game back on Tuesday in the EFL Trophy. So, back in basically now properly. It's good to be back basically. Yeah, because it's been a, a troubling time, I think, for everybody in football across the world. I think it's just it's more and more than life and just football, basically. I think we've just had to take a step back and realise there's a lot more important things going on. But I think we're sort of seeing a wee bit of light at the end of the tunnel now and hopefully things in the not-so-distant future can go back to normal. How have you found the testing protocols and things like that at Carlisle? Because if they're anything like they are up here in the SPFL, then they're probably hellish. The the test isn't very nice, I'll say that, to be honest. It's maybe the worst 30 seconds ever, but it's got to be done, hasn't it? We've all got to be make sure that we're, we're keeping safe, basically. So we've been done maybe four times, I think, we've been done. I don't think it's as strict. I think we had to get done before we return to the first part, phase one training, and then we had to get done before phase two, and then before the competitive games. But I don't think it's been as strict as what it has in Scotland, where they've, I think they've been done twice a week of the but it's been twice a week for the whole time. So as long as we're coming back with a negative sort of result, I think hopefully we're okay. But I think they'll be keeping them up now, I would say definitely, at least until Christmas, I would imagine. Yeah, because in Scotland, I think it is still twice a week. That could be wrong by the time this comes out. But I think the problem in Scotland has been is we've had a couple of troublemakers that probably haven't arised in uh, the year. Yeah. Which, not say, I'm not saying there's loads of troublemakers in the EFL, but you would like, I mean, if you compare the amount of teams, then, I mean, if you do the numbers, then you'd like to think there's more chance in the EFL of things going wrong in Scotland, but alas. I, get, I, I don't know, maybe it's just been, uh, teams have, uh, there's obviously been positive tests, I think, back when the playoffs from last season were coming on, sort of, uh, May time, I think there was a couple of positive tests come out, but you've just got to follow the protocols, but like you said, in terms of them getting tested twice a week, it might change. That's the thing. Everything's changing. It's always evolving, basically every day almost at some points where a new protocol comes in and then that changes and something else. So I think it's just, you basically do what you're told, basically. <laughs> as bluntly as that sounds, you just do what you're told. But if you've got just outside of football, you've just got to be sort of looking out for yourself. You can't be going out and going out, basically, and being out on nights out and stuff like that. You've got to sort of look, look at what you're doing and, basically looking out because you're caring for your family and that at the same time you're affecting other folks so you can't really be selfish in that aspect mm-hmm. and I think it's very different from like uh, St Mirren was one was one of the staff members there I'm pretty sure one of their family members they live with got it from their work and it got passed into the house that's very different from a certain player flying out to another country and then <laughs> breaking the protocols, so I think it's all... Yeah, I think I'll agree with you, that's a, bit, that's a wee bit different to be fair, so it's like you said, there's times where like so that St Mirren, uh, St Mirren player, there's nothing that you can really do about that, the, the player's going to train and doing what he's doing, the training, coming back to his family, and somebody's sort of got it, if they've been out of work, he sort of can't, it's one of those things that you've just got to accept almost, but as, from the player's aspect, we've just got to make sure that we're doing all that we can to make sure everyone else is safe as well. And I mean, have you been briefed at all yet? And when sort of teams like Carlisle can expect to see fans back? I know in the lower steps of English football, you've started to see a return format sort of from under National League North. It's funny you've asked that today because I've actually just seen so we played in the EFL Trophy on Tuesday. We were was behind closed doors. We play in the League Cup on Saturday behind closed doors. But our first league game against Cambridge a week on Saturday on the twelfth, there's actually going to be fans there. I think it's the one own, it's a test event. It's the only ground in England, the first ground in England that are actually going to stage fans. I think it's a, a maximum of two, two and a half thousand. So it'll be good to see how that sort of goes. Home fans only, obviously, there will be no travelling away fans, but at least there'll be some sort of fans there. No disrespect to Cambridge, but that's maybe what they get for a normal league game anyway. So it might be sort of back to normal for them. But like I said before, it's good to see that sort of some some light almost at the end of the tunnel and slowly but surely getting back to a wee bit of normal, but just got to do it slowly but surely, basically. That must be a real boost for Carlisle because you'll the club will probably miss the most of the behind-closed-door stuff then if you're only having to deal with a couple of games. I know testing and stuff isn't cheap, but it's going to be better than some clubs. 
Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, in terms of like Scotland, Scotland have maybe played six or seven games now where a lot of the clubs rely on that sort of revenue. So they missed out on that. Whereas I think if, if it is going to be, if there is going to be some sort of fans there next Saturday for the first league game, the next one when we're at home, they might be the same. So we're not really missing out on anything. So you're right. Yeah, it is definitely a, a big boost. And it's not just, not just that for in terms of the club, uh, getting the revenue in as the players as well, having your, your fans backing you it is a big mass it is a big boost to be fair. So hopefully hopefully it isn't too soon and hopefully we're doing well at that point and we can get the crowds back in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, seeing even the smallest of cash injections, how big it can be for clubs like your old ones, Queen of the South, the London Dykes transfer gets them six figures and they've basically brought their full squad for the season off the back of it. In yeah. terms of teams like that in the championship it's massive. I mean them sort of them sort of three or four games in a month is like the wages for basically the players in a month, I would imagine, wouldn't be far off. So you're right, I'm sure it has been a hard time for teams and uh, for clubs, especially the lower down, sort of, sort of lower down the ladder, basically. So the government's been good in terms of the furlough scheme and stuff like that. We got, I think, basically every team in the EFL got put on the furlough scheme. So it was good and it was also good to see in terms of Scottish teams as well. The players that weren't getting contracts at the end of the season, they extended the furlough, so they man- they managed to still get another month's paid. But them little things are massive to players, and it's it shows great generosity from the, the clubs to do that. Basically, mm-hmm. you must be buzzing to sort of just get a, a contract in that. So I don't know. I mean, I mean, it's playing a bit of air, but it seems as if you've managed to get a contract fairly smoothly in this period. A lot. I had a, a wee bit of interest, but interest means nothing until there's an actual contract and on the table basically so yeah I was very grateful for them to, to give me that contract because there's a lot of players that I know that now that I still haven't got anything that are still out of contract so teams like we said the, the teams are working with a lot of uh, are working with smaller squads and in terms of like the League 1 League 2 teams you get five loans so teams will be using a lot of them loans up to fill the spaces and then the younger guys will be getting more of a chance so the likes of I'm only 27 but the likes of the older guys and me are the ones that are the older guys are the ones that will struggle. So, no, I was very grateful to especially get it tied up early doors almost right at the start of pre-season. So, but with the extended window, I still think there'll, there'll definitely be a flurry of activity in terms of the teams looking to fill the rest of them spaces before the window shuts. I think it's the middle of October. Mm. Yeah, it's the middle of October. So you would yeah. think that as the, as the season starts as well, I suppose that's handy for clubs. You've, you have got that period, maybe if two or three games in, you start to say, right, we need to do this and that. There is a bit of wiggle room a couple of injuries come up and stuff as well so it sort of changes you, you you're thinking of where you sort of need to recruit so but no it, it definitely helps teams in terms of having that wee bit we on basically a month later than when the, the first game is but in terms of Carlisle's uh, for, for us one of the good things we've done is a lot of the guys that have come in they've signed them all out of doors so we've come in straight away at the start of pre-season so it's good for the club to sort of do that because it means we can there's more time for us to gel and get together in terms of building and training ready for the season mm-hmm. It sounds as if you are a bit more stable because I know for some clubs it just hasn't been as easy just because of circumstances they've not been able to tie up players so quickly No, I've been quite impressed by the way Carl went about things because they explained that they made no redundancies over the whole course in terms of the lockdown and uh, the, the club not being active basically everyone in terms of the, the backroom staff and all have all kept their jobs so they have like you said they are structured very well and they have things very well run so in terms of me coming here it was quite appealing in, in terms of that sense as well mm-hmm. Just in terms of um, Scottish football have you spoke to anybody in Scottish football just during this period just for a bit of insight into the buying coast? Uh, I'm good friends with a guy called Patrick Slattery that's at East Fife okay. when I played with him when I was younger at Queen of the South and then when I was at Hearts and living in Edinburgh he stayed with me so they are now back in training uh, East Fife are back in training last week he was saying and said it's a lot different in terms of they're not allowed to get a shower and they've got to get changed in their car and like, basically eat in their cars and that when they were in for their double session on Saturday so I think it's just the new normal now I think teams are everyone's just got to adapt it basically but as long as we're getting football back that's the main thing mm-hmm. They're all having to play without wages because they're all paying for Danny Swanson's <laughs> Maybe yeah no no Danny was a good guy I was at heart so he's a very big good signing for for them to be fair so he's a uh, you know, I think he'll do well there definitely. Mm. It's just a, it's very interesting times for Scottish football just in terms of all this because it's a shortened um, championship season as well. I think you know well and 
you know more than most that you do in every game counts in that division. So he'd be playing, I think it's 28. It's got, it'll be interesting. Uh, yeah, they play each other three times, I think it is, rather than four. So, like you said, it's, it does, every game does count because t- in terms of seasons gone by, anyone can be anyone in that championship from the top of the league to the bottom of the league. It's very competitive. So, it might, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see how them teams sort of adapt to that, especially if you, in terms of the teams at the top of the table, if you're playing a team high up there away twice rather than home and away twice, it'll sort of maybe kick in. So, no, it'll be interesting to see that, but as long as the, at least the season's starting, basically, in terms of they were talking like it wasn't going to start till after Christmas. So at least they have got it. It's going to get up and running. And we're talking positively about fans being back in the stadiums coming soon. I think it's the middle of October that they start. So hopefully by that point, a lot of them teams will have some sort of fans in at that stage. Because for a lot of teams in that league, it, it, the fans and the revenue that they get from the gate receipts is massive for them. I think the good thing with championship clubs now, I'm not a medical expert, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but I think by the sounds of it is that because of the social distancing, because of the average crowd at a championship game, I think most-ish fans, at least 50% from what I've been reading, are going to get into games, which will probably be a bigger boost at this point than clubs were expecting. I think when I was at Queen of the South, we used to average about 14, 1,500 for a home game. Apart from if you got maybe Celtic, eh, Rangers or Hearts or Hibs the season they were done. But in terms of a normal game, you would get 1,500 folk in Palmerston social distance easily. They said, like you said, likes of air and grounds like that, especially with the terrace. And there's, they're big grounds when yeah, we actually see them. So like you said, you get 50% of the maximum capacity in there easy. And 50% is better than 0%, isn't it? So it'll be a massive boost for them sort of clubs. Mm, just on sort of your season ahead, I know you're... Um... Your best goal scoring season seems to be at St Mirren. You hoping Carlisle now that you're you're there permanently, perhaps a return to that type of form? I'd like to think so. Anyone's hoping to to match or better their sort of best season. So I think one of the main reasons why I'd done so well at St Mirren that season was the fact that I was playing basically every game, but I was playing with a good team where they were creating chances for me. So there's times went by where it's been frustrating down in England where I've not really been getting them sort of chances. So I think if I was to get a good run of games here this season, that I'm confident that I can sort of replicate that sort of season. OK, it did really just seem to click for you. It was one of those seasons that some players just have where everything you do just seems to turn out all right for you. I think we just had a feel-good factor right throughout the whole team. We we kept our sort of targets and aims in-house almost. Everyone was tipping the likes of Dundee United and Falkirk to go and win the league. Whereas we just went, I think we went out about our business. Professional is probably the best word to describe it. We're, we knew we had good players. We knew we could go and do well in this league. So, and I think we just went and done it. And we had the players that ended up doing well. It wasn't just myself that had a good season. It was like so Lewis Morgan was brilliant. That an outstanding season. Cammy Smith was brilliant. And Stephen McGinney and McShane there in the centre mid as well. So, throughout the team, we just had the right balance and the right mix that basically won the league in the end. Mm-hmm. And because you basically you scored the goals, but it was also like you had the blend of boys that had been in the academy set up there, and you also. Yeah. Had players like me, Shane, who have sort of been there. Well, he is at Darville now, who just seem to be chucking money at the wall with nobody's business. <laughs> uh, I know, I've seen that. But, uh, no, it just, you just seem to have a good blend that year. Yeah, the likes of Craig Sampson and Goals, he was another one, very experienced at the back, and I think he broke the record at one point for the amount of clean sheets in a row, or amount of games we won and hadn't conceded, basically. So, uh, just like I said, this, it wasn't just one man that won the league that season, it was a, the whole team, basically. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it's no surprise well maybe it is I don't know you can give me your thoughts on the Jack, how Jack Ross has done since then uh, I thought he'd done I thought he was, he was a wee bit harsh for what happened to him at Sunderland I'm, I'm a big admirer for him one because he took the chance of me to take me to there and the, the fact he played me when I was at St Mirren as well so I think in terms of his coaching and his management, he's brilliant. But he obviously got the chance to go down there. They're a humongous club, sort of the thing that he can't really turn down. He tried to prove that he was good enough to, to manage down there. And they were just, I think throughout the season, they were just a wee bit unlucky in terms of the big games. They just sort of froze a wee bit. I think the two finals, the final and the the EFL trophy, the checker trade, they were unlucky. And then in the playoff final, but I, I think... They were right up there in terms of the season when he got sacked. They were right up there. So I think it was a wee bit harsh to do it that early on in the season. It would have been, maybe if it was close to Christmas, you never know. But I think 
they hadn't actually done too bad. So I thought it was a wee bit harsh, to be honest. But like to them big clubs, they're always they're, they're desperate for success. So it's up to them to make them decisions, basically. Did you ever come across him in week one while you were down there? Uh, yeah, played against, played against him. Uh, I was injured the game when we played them up at the Stadium of Light. But I started against them when we uh, played them down at, at Bristol Rovers, basically. So I got a good chat with him there and stuff. It was good to catch up with him. And James Fowler is assistant as well. I still speak to quite regularly now. So it's good to catch up with them guys. And it's good to... It's good to see them after the disappointment of them leaving Sunderland. They've all managed to sort of... Jack's now the manager of Hibs and uh, James is the head of operations at Kilmanic. So it's good to see them get back into football so early as well. Mm -hmm. I think with Jack Ross, especially, like, it, he's more than proven now in Scottish football. I mean, he's been at Hibs for a year, I was looking at, which is just mind-boggling to me, considering everyone that went on at Sunderland. Yeah. He's like, I think they've got the most points or something outside the old firm, so... Yeah, they've, they've started the season really well. Mm -hmm, yeah, and the job he's done at St Mirren and Alloa, just, he has proven these days. It, it, like I said, it just proves he is a brilliant manager and he's a great coach, but going down to, you going down to England, they're not long in terms of, especially at a club like Sunderland, if you haven't brought success, they sort of, they are calling, they have looked to make changes, basically, is. It's just the industry that we we play in, basically, that is so cutthroat. It's, if you're not doing your job, somebody else is waiting to basically take the job from you, almost. Mm -hmm. Just on your um, your season upcoming, what are your sort of hopes for your season with Carlisle? I think that in terms of, like the manager said in his press, that the budget that we've got, we shouldn't really be doing anything. But we know that we've got good players here and we know that with the togetherness that we've got, we can have a successful season. So I think it's just about getting... I think in terms of England, it's very important. The amount of, if you put a run of games together, anything can sort of happen because it's that tight. So I think if we just if we take each game as it comes almost, we obviously want to look towards a successful season, but we don't want to be shooting for the stars basically straight away. We've got to just bed our way in. There is some good teams and some big teams in this league, like of Bolton and Mansfield, a lot of big teams there, big budgets. There'll be a lot of pressure on them to do well. Because I think if we just sort of go about our own business the way we've been doing almost, I think we, there's no reason why we can't be successful. From no, a sort of personal point of view, I just want to basically get, a, like I said, I'm here permanent now, I just want to get a full season play and hopefully score some goals and just see where that takes me. Mm -hmm. Because um, last season showed that you had, even in League 2, you had Northampton who weren't fancied to go up, they went up via the playoffs and the same in League 1 with Wickham who I don't know how they managed to get out of League 1 in the end. So it does prove that it's a bit like the Scottish Championship up here that if you have a decent season then there's not much between the clubs on them basically. Like I said, it's just about put, if you get yourself on a run and you put them points together, you go on maybe five or six games winning streak. Anything can sort of happen with that. You end up right at the top of the table, but you turn that flip that on its head, if you end up on a run of five or six defeats, then you're right down in there and in the mix at the bottom. So it's just about consistency is probably the best word to describe it. You've just got to try and be as consistent as you can and Every point matters, basically. So you're going away from home and things aren't really working for you. Them sort of points away from home almost are, are valuable, almost. 